Welcome to today's webinar, Understanding the Pulsed Form. Thank you all for being here. These complimentary webinars are brought to you through a collaboration with O'Connor Mortuary, Care Choice Hospice and Palliative Services, Caring Companions at Home, and Alzheimer's Orange County. And my name is Kim Bailey from Alzheimer's Orange County, and I'll be your host today. The three sponsors are providing these webinars as a service to the community on topics that are beneficial for anyone who cares for and works with older adults. We hope you find them informative and useful. Today, we are so pleased to have our own Patty Matan uh, with us to present on the topic of the post. Uh, I, let me go ahead and introduce Patty to you. Actually, many of you know her. She's worked in healthcare in Orange County since 1980. She is serving as Vice President Outreach and Advocacy, or she did serve as Vice President Outreach and Advocacy for Alzheimer's Orange County since 2005 after volunteering for five years as a speaker and support group facilitator while she was working in hospice care. Now she manages clinical outreach and education for physicians, nurses, social workers, and other healthcare providers, uh, as well as leading the, uh, the advocacy and public policy activities of, of Alzheimer's Orange County at the local, state, and federal levels. She's active excuse me, she's active in the Orange County Aging Services Collaborative and has served as co-chair of the Orange County Pulsed Coalition, now known as the OC Advanced Care Planning Partners since 2010. She currently serves as chair of the Cal Optima One Care Connect Advisory Committee, and she has been appointed to the City of Laguna Niguel Senior Citizens Commission. Patty's been a featured lecturer at many national and statewide conferences, including the National Pulse Paradigm Conference, California Council of Geriatrics and Gerontology, American Society on Aging National Conference, and the California Association of Health Services at Home Conference. She holds a certificate in the Fundamentals of Gerontology from USC, a certificate in Palliative Chaplaincy from UC, uh, US, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> CSU San Marcos, and a BS in Human Services. So. It's my great pleasure to turn the uh, presentation over to our VP, Patty Mouton. And thank you, Patty, for being here and sharing your expertise with everyone. Thank you, Kim. This is so much fun. Um, I'm really pleased to be able to share this part of our information with you, and we'll get right started. Um, many people are still unfamiliar with the POLST. It stands for Physician Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment. Um, it's an acronym that um, portrays a document that's a medical legal order and it gives patients more control over their care by specifying the types of medical treatment they want to receive during serious illness and especially if they can't speak for themselves. It encourages good communication between healthcare providers and patients. It enables patients to make very much more informed decisions and it helps to clearly communicate these decisions to a patient's healthcare providers. The POLST can really help to ensure that patient wishes are known and honored. It can prevent unwanted or medically ineffective treatment, and it really helps in reducing patient and family suffering. The POLST has been in, um, in California since 2008, and it was enacted by statute in 2009. It's been changed a number of times. About every three years, there's a new version of the POLST, and that conforms with best practices across the United States. So why do we need a POLST? Well, studies show that patients' wishes about care frequently are not known, even if the patient has an advanced health care directive. And oftentimes, that directive is not any place accessible when the patient's become very ill or can't speak for themselves. It's usually locked up with other important papers or in a file at the attorney's office. So advanced directives also 
are not always clearly defined about what the patient wants. Very often you see advanced healthcare directives say no heroic measures, but there's no definition of what that actually means with respect to treatment. And advanced healthcare directives are for future care, they're not a medical order, and really the function of the advanced healthcare directive is primarily to name the patient's agent in the event they cannot speak for themselves. The POST form is very clear about the patient's wishes. It should be very easy to access and always travel with the patient, and it's an actionable legal medical order that healthcare providers must follow. The POST allows healthcare providers to not only know the patient's wishes in the event of a serious illness, but it gives them a framework in which to honor them. Well, why do we really need it? Well, hope is not a plan. And even if we had do not resuscitate tattooed on our chests, it wouldn't be an actionable legal order. About 25% of Americans currently have put their wishes in writing. But 50% of us cannot speak for ourselves when we really need to make decisions about care. So let me tell you just a little bit about our coalition, the Orange County Advanced Care Planning Partners. We are guided and directed by the Coalition for Compassionate Care of California, the folks who brought the POST to California excuse me, to California. We are an active member and kind of a child of the Orange County Aging Services Collaborative, the group of not-for-profit agencies that serve older adults in Orange County. And we received initial funding from the California Healthcare Foundation and the SCAN Foundation. And since 2010, this coalition has been housed in the infrastructure of Alzheimer's Orange County. So we really appreciate that support. So let's talk about a real patient, Mr. Jones. He's an 83-year-old man. He has severe congestive heart failure. He's living in a skilled nursing facility now after a stay in the hospital for a pneumonia. He developed increasing shortness of breath. He was minimally responsive. So the SNF staff called 911 for patient transport to the hospital. The emergency department physician could not find any code status information in his paperwork, and so he wrote full code. Mr. Jones then required intubation, and he was transferred to the ICU. All too often, this is the story that we see. But here's what we didn't know. Mr. Jones had an advanced health care directive. It wasn't in the paperwork that was sent to the hospital because it wasn't at the skilled nursing facility. It was at his home with his important papers. He had been asked about it on admission to the SNF, but his family hadn't brought it with them, and they were always going to go and get it and look through that, that file drawer. Um, so it wasn't in his SNF medical record. Mr. Jones had talked with his family and with the SNF about his desire not to go back to the hospital. He didn't want to receive any more aggressive treatment. And there was documentation of this conversation in the nurse's notes at the SNF, but not in any documentation or charting that was sent to the hospital. And of course, when an emergency strikes or when a crisis happens, where's the family? They were not available. They were out of the area. So everybody had good intentions, but we couldn't follow through appropriately on Mr. Jones' wishes because we didn't have it in writing. And the critically important people, the healthcare providers at the hospital, didn't have any way to know what his wishes actually were. So the advanced healthcare directive wasn't transferred with the patient. The skilled nursing facility didn't have it, so they couldn't transfer it. Mr. Jones' wishes of not being resuscitated were not documented in a way that was easily found by the staff. So when he was transferred to the acute care hospital, um, there was no code status with his papers. He received over-treatment, which went against what his expressed wishes had been. And because of this, he experienced some unnecessary pain and suffering, and there he was in the ICU, which is where he had said he did not want to be.
So this is an indicator of a system-wide failure to document and honor a patient's wishes and to fully know what the patient's wishes are. There wasn't a consistent, recognizable plan in place and Mr. Jones' wishes were not communicated all across the medical systems. So emergency medical services, the SNF, the hospital, in essence, they all did the right thing, the default, which is to treat aggressively, but it was not in accordance with what the patient's expressed wishes were. So what is the POLST? It's a medical legal order that should be recognized throughout the medical care system. It goes with the patient. It's portable. So it should be transferred with the patient from one care setting to the next. And because it's typically in this horrible, obnoxious, bright pink color, it should stand out among other paperwork in a, in a chart. And for the whole state, the POLST is standardized. And you'll notice in the top left-hand corner, it has the emergency medical system indicia. And that means that emergency medical services workers, emergency department workers, all healthcare providers, anyone coming in contact with that patient is now bound to respect this as a medical legal order unless there is some compelling medical judgment to override it. It provides direction, and I think that's really the, the most important point, is it allows people to make choices about what they want to receive and identify the types of care that they would not want, and thereby provides really great direction for healthcare providers, especially during a crisis. So who benefits from having a POLST? It's not for everyone. It's not even for every elderly person, and it's not even for every elderly person or person who has some sort of serious illness. It's for a very specific type of population. And it's important to determine this surprise question. If the patient that you're providing care for is someone for whom you would not be surprised if they died within the next year, then the POLST is likely appropriate. And I tell people, I have a 96-year-old mother. She's in really good health. She's very active. She's ambulatory, and she's still um, expounding on her own political views and making sure other people conform. But she's 96 years old. Would any of you be surprised if she didn't make it to 97? Of course not. She's far outlived current life expectancy, so it wouldn't be a surprise. She doesn't suffer from any terribly serious illnesses, but she still would be an appropriate candidate for a POLST. Likewise, if you have a patient that's 62 but has a serious uh, diagnosis of perhaps stage four cancer. We'd all be unhappy and sad if this patient didn't survive, but probably no one would be surprised if they died in a year. So age is not the determinant. It's the seriousness of their health condition, medical frailty, and that surprise question. A helpful tool remains the surprise question. It reflects that determination of who's appropriate for POLST. This is an art, it's not really a science. So POLST was introduced in the United States in 1991 in Oregon and has now expanded to more than half of the United States. It was developed initially for skilled nursing facility patients who were being transferred back and forth from one care setting to the next. The use of the, of the POLST has expanded considerably. And as I said, we've had it here in California by statute since 2009. And this gives you an idea of the different maturity of POLST programs throughout the United States. It continues to develop this use of the POLST. And right now, the POLST is just state specific. Although, if you have an enlightened emergency department in a state other than where you live, if you bring your post form with you and you have a health crisis, then that team is likely to honor what's on another state's post form, but they are not required to do so. 
We know the POLST is successful and effective. Uh, one study in Oregon showed um, addressed the location of death in the POLST orders, and in 58,000 deaths reviewed, 31% in this particular study had POLST in the state of Oregon. And it shows that patients' treatment choices can be honored, including those that say, I want to avoid dying in the hospital, and I want more limited interventions. So we know that the POLST really works and is becoming um, a bona fide part of our healthcare system and landscape. Um, in California, the Coalition for Compassionate Care of California is the lead agency, and they handle uh, orchestrating changes to the document and convening the work groups statewide. California Healthcare Foundation still provides support to the effort, but mostly this education and the dissemination and actual use of POLST happens through grassroots efforts of our local coalitions, just like what you have here in Orange County was initially enacted in 2009, and then it was um, considerably amended in 2016, and that is the time at which nurse practitioners and physician assistants were also authorized to sign the POLST. In California, it's one form for the entire state. No one is required to have a POLST. No matter how appropriate they are for having it, they're not required. It's completely voluntary. And so often what we see sometimes in skilled nursing facilities is on admission, everybody is asked to complete a POLST form. That's actually not in line with good POLST practices. It's really only for those patients for whom no one would be surprised if they died within a year. While use of the POLST is voluntary, honoring an executed POLST form is mandated. And if a healthcare practitioner follows the patient's wishes as prescribed in the POLST form, then that provider is immune from civil or criminal liability, um, for example, in a wrongful death. If somebody did not provide CPR according to a POLST uh, directive and the family was upset about that, the provider who opted not to provide CPR and follow the POLST directives would not be held liable in either a sim civil or a criminal court. So how does it work with the patient's advanced health care directive? It's a complementary form. It actually is the next step after advanced health care directive. It's not intended to replace the health care directive. They're both legal documents, but the POLST is a medical order. The POLST aims to turn the values and wishes expressed in a person's advanced health care directive into an actionable medical treatment order that can be easily understood and then followed by the health care providers, including emergency medical services. In California, the term advanced health care directive includes both the durable power of attorney for health care and the living will. So a little comparison of POLST versus Advanced Healthcare Directive. Everyone over the age of 18 should have an Advanced Healthcare Directive, especially now with HIPAA compliance laws being so stringently enforced. Uh, if you've got kids in college, you want to be sure they have a health care directive naming parents as the person who can receive and make decisions for them um, on health care information that would be considered private. The POLST, however, is only for those who are seriously ill and frail, and it's a medical order for treatment that could be coming up in the very near future. The Advanced Healthcare Directive is general instructions for treatment sometime in the future. The Advanced Healthcare Directive's primary goal is to name the decision maker, the agent for the person, should that patient not be able to speak for themselves. The POLST, however, could be signed by a decision maker and hopefully, the decision maker noted on the POLST is the same as the person noted in that same patient's advanced health care directive. 
The post fits in in this care continuum as part of a bigger, longer-term conversation about patients' wishes. And it really comes at a time when somebody is very seriously ill, regardless of age. It can be updated, and as with any important legal docu document, including the Advanced Healthcare Directive, it should be reviewed at least every five years to check that the names, the contact information, and the wishes are still consistent with the patient's current information and with the patient's current wishes. Over the course of time, we have divorces, we have deaths in the family, we have estrangement, we have people who move far out of the area. So it's important that these documents be reviewed at least every five years or upon a major change in the patient's condition. So let's look at the POLST and compare it to the pre-hospital do not resuscitate order, the DNR. There's many similarities. They're both medical orders. Um, both address the issue of do not resuscitate if the person is not breathing and they have no heartbeat. Both are for those who are medically frail or those with chronic serious illness. The pre-hospital DNR was developed by California Emergency Medical Services Authority to instruct EMS personnel to forego CPR or resuscitation attempts in the event of a patient's cardiopulmonary arrest. This form is designed for use in pre-hospital settings like the patient's home, in a long-term care facility, when they're being transported, transported to an acute care facility and in other locations outside the acute care hospital. A comparison is the POLST allows to choose resuscitation if the patient wants. The pre-hospital DNR is only if you're choosing not to resuscitate. The POLST allows for decisions about other medical treatments, such as treatment during serious illness, artificial hydration, nutrition, etc. The pre-hospital DNR is only applicable to resuscitation attempts. The POLST is honored across all healthcare settings, and the pre-hospital DNR is just for those settings outside the acute care hospital. So the POLST is a much more comprehensive document than the pre-hospital DNR. A DNR medallion or bracelet can be purchased with either a signed pre-hospital DNR or a POLST form. And one resource is the California Emergency Medical Services Authority. Um, so people do have the right to, to choose DNR um, and to use the pre-hospital DNR, but it's a very limited document. Let's talk about the POLST versus the PIC, the Preferred Intensity of Care document. The PIC form is going to be different in every skilled nursing facility, while the POLST form is going to be consistent across the state. And I think that's important because you might have some differences in PIC forms that have some gaps in information. The POLST is a legal medical order honored across all healthcare settings, but the PIC is not a medical order. It's similar to a doctor's note, but it's not an order. And the PIC cannot transfer to another healthcare setting. It's only used within that particular SNF. So it has a great deal more limitations than the POLST. Both include choices for the types of medical interventions the patient might want. But the POLST is a voluntary form. In a skilled nursing facility, usually the PIC is required as people are admitted. At discharge from the SNF, the patient can choose to take the POLST home and follow up with his or her primary care physician, or the patient can choose to, vo to void the POLST form at any time, but especially upon discharge. And um, as we get to a little longer into the program, we'll talk about how to void or change a POLST form. Let's take a look at the POLST form itself. Pull out your copy of the POLST. 
What stands out when you look at it? If you have a real pulsed form, you not only see that it's really, really pink, but it's usually on 65 pound cardstock paper. If you make copies of the form, try to use the pink. It's called ultra pink, um, so it's easily found and immediately recognized, especially in an emergency. But the post is honored no matter what color paper it's on, um, if it's a photocopy or a fax. Um, I've even heard that some emergency departments have honored a, a screenshot of a post form on someone's uh, phone. Um, it's two-sided, and it's important that both sides be completed correctly with all the required information located on the front and the back of the form. The minimum requirements are that we have the patient's last name, first name, date of birth, a selection in Section A, and a selection in Section B, the signature of the physician, nurse practitioner, or PA, the name and signature of a patient or legally recognized decision maker, and a date, the date the form is prepared, the date the physician or NP or PA signs it, or the date that the patient or decision maker signs it. There should not be a conflict, and this is important, between attempted resuscitation in, in Section A. If you say, I want to attempt resuscitation in Section A, then full treatment must be selected in Section B. That's important. And if you are transmitting this form, it's really very important that you fax and copy both sides. Let's move to the different sections of the form. Here we see the top section on the front side. It says, HIPAA permits disclosure of POLST to other healthcare providers as necessary. That's important because if you're in the height of a crisis, you don't want to have to have people sign uh, HIPAA releases. The logo in the upper left-hand corner, as I said, is California Emergency Medical Services Authority. This ensures that EMS must honor the form and take action based on the patient wishes as stated in the form. And below that is the effective date of the form. This, in this case, it shows you that this is one of the revised forms which became effective um, on, uh, in 2017. And that's important. If you have an older post form, you might want to have somebody redo their form. Um, doesn't mean they have to change their wishes, but um, there, it may be easier in the long run to have the updated form in use. All right, so Section A, CPR. What must be happening with the patient for us to be taking action in this section? Well, the patient has to have no pulse and not be breathing. And also note the statement, if the patient is not in cardiopulmonary arrest, follow orders in sections B and C. It's important for the patient and family to understand that if you have no pulse and are not breathing, you are dead. And not doing CPR allows a natural death. We don't do CPR on people that are hale and hearty. If they're breathing and they have a pulse, they don't need CPR. Let's look at the two choices. Number one is attempt resuscitation CPR. The key word here is attempt. As part of the conversation about POLST, it's important to educate the patient and family that CPR doesn't always work. There are pretty low percentages of actual success. And what does it say next to attempt resuscitation CPR? Selecting CPR in Section A requires selecting full treatment in Section B. The other choice, number two, is do not attempt resuscitation, DNR. Now, what does it say next to this? Allow natural death. One of the instructions on the back of the form also indicates that if found pulseless and not breathing, 
no defibrillator, including automated external defibrillators or chest compressions should be used on a patient who has chosen do not attempt resuscitation. It's pretty clear. Section B. Section B addresses medical interventions. The first thing to establish is that the patient is alive. If the patient is found with a pulse and or breathing, then treat as di directed in Section B. A person must have a pulse to be breathing, but sometimes it's weak and difficult to detect. There are three checkboxes in this section, as well as a place to write additional orders. Prior versions of the POLST are still effective, but this version from 2017 makes it really um, flow much more easily. But it's essential to carefully read the POLST form and then follow the patient's wishes. Each option in Section B includes a goal statement to help patients understand the goals of care within each option and help promote quality conversations with patients, family, and or legally recognized decision makers. Full treatment, the first option. The primary goal of prolonging life by all medically effective means includes a box which can be marked trial period of full treatment. This gives people some flexibility or latitude. They may want full treatment to see if they can survive, to see if they could come back, but they don't want to be on a ventilator, for example, indefinitely. In the next option, selective treatment, the goal of treating medical conditions while avoiding burdensome measures. Burdens of treatment may include complications, pain, weakness. A checkbox is included for SNF patients who may choose request transfer to hospital only if comfort needs cannot be met in current location. And then the third option is comfort focused treatment where the primary goal is that of maximizing the patient's comfort. Care would then be focused on comfort, not on treating the patient's illnesses. And note the statement, request transfer to hospital only if comfort needs cannot be met in the current location. The transfer statements say request transfer because calling 911 is the request, possibly by family or staff at a SNF or assisted living facility. A patient with decision-making capacity and able to speak for themselves could still refuse transfer. With full treatment and selective treatment, antibiotics usually would be given in hopes of curing an infection. Antibiotics are generally not considered for comfort-focused treatment, but might be used to promote comfort. For example, if the patient has a urinary tract infection and they're having burning or a sense of urgency, then an antibiotic course of treatment would be thoroughly indicated. But for other types of infections, it may not be. Um, this section talks about cardioversion. That's restoring the heart's rhythm to normal by means of electrical shock, medications, or ablation. Non-invasive positive airway pressure includes continuous positive airway pressure, CPAP, bi-level positive airway pr pressure, BiPAP, and bag valve mask, BVM, assisted respirations and manual treatment of airway obstruction, the Heimlich maneuver if somebody's choking. Um, and let's take a look then at how sections A and B work together. If you're choosing attempt resuscitation and CPR in section A, that then requires choosing full treatment in section B. It is not acceptable to request attempt CPR and then selective or comfort focused treatment. Now, now why would that be? Well, if we're going to bring you back and attempt CPR to get a pulse and breathing going, then of course we want to follow that up with treatment to keep you going. So that's an important distinction. If a person wants CPR, they have to be willing to have advanced cardiac life support and follow those guidelines, and that includes intubation and care in the ICU. 
do not attempt resuscitation, DNR, may, we ch may be chosen with any of the following medical interventions in poll section B. DNR may be chosen with full treatment, and this applies to a patient who has a pulse or perhaps is breathing and wants aggressive medical interventions, but who doesn't want to be resuscitated if found without a pulse or not breathing, otherwise known as naturally dead. It's important to address the length of treatment, the severity of illness, and the prognosis with this option. You'd want to ask the patient, if you did not get better, and doctors thought your chances of a good recovery were poor, would you want to be kept alive on the ventilator? If the patient does not want to be kept on prolonged life support, the box under full treatment, trial period of full treatment, can be checked. Possible additional orders might relate to dialysis, chemotherapy, blood transfusions, or automatic implantable, cardioverter defibrillator, AICDs. If the patient has an AICD, it might, they might want to have it deactivated as they get closer to end of life. The Pulse conversation includes discussion regarding long-term intensive medical treatment. So it's important that we all understand what CPR is and what the statistics are for success, that we understand when we say ventilation, it means being mechanically ventilated on a machine. We need to understand all these different options well enough to be able to explain them to people who have questions when they're completing their POLST form. Let's look at Section C. Section C addresses long-term artificially administered nutrition, such as during end-stage dementia or Parkinson's disease or following a devastating injury or illness. Food should always be offered by mouth if it's feasible and desired by the patient. Patients may choose between three options related to artificial nutrition. They can have long-term artificial nutrition, including a feeding tube. Studies have shown that for individuals with late-stage dementia or advanced terminal illnesses, pneumonia and pressure ulcers, are not prevented with tube feeding, and in fact, long-term use of artificial nutrition and hydration might exacerbate some of these conditions. A trial period of artificial nutrition, including feeding tubes. The time frame or duration of the trial period is not decided ahead of time. The physician should and will discuss what is appropriate for the individual at the time this treatment might be needed. Feeding tubes also in this conversation include total parenteral nutrition or TPN. And then you have the option that someone could check saying no artificial means of nutrition, including feeding tubes. Again, prior versions of the POLST form would have had this information in a different order. So it's very important to carefully read the POLST form as it's presented um, in the event the patient is needing his or her wishes complied to on an executed POLST. And if it's from a different year, if it's a prior version of the POLST, we would want to read it very carefully just to ensure we know exactly what the patient is saying. And as we would discuss this with the patient, we would want to really talk to them about artificial hydration and nutrition and make sure they, they fully understand all sides and all ramifications. So we'll say this so many times, the POLST is about a conversation. It's not just checking the boxes. And we should pre be providing context of each of these options as we're having the conversation. And it's not a one and done kind of conversation. To complete a POLST form with a patient, it might take two or three extensive conversations in order to ensure that they have the context of their illness and that they've had time to really consider what their options and wishes might be. We would want to be able to ask questions like, what would you want in the event of, and then paint a picture for them. Our role is really to facilitate this conversation and explore what the patient goals of care would be. 
We would want to give medical examples of what could happen in the future and use it to help clarify the patient's goals of care and then focus the conversation. So you might say, if you had a really bad case of pneumonia and then transition into discussion in section B about medical interventions. It really helps to help patients make informed choices, to really know what their options are, and to identify what their personal goals of treatment would be. Then we get to section D, which is information and signatures. Notice the checkboxes for whom the post was discussed with. The patient, and when the patient has capacity, a legally recognized decision maker, when the patient lacks capacity, or when the patient has designated that the decision maker's authority is effective immediately, and that would be on the back of the post form. In the next slides, we'll discuss the decision maker's role. But there are also checkboxes for advanced directive dated, available, and reviewed. We would want to have an advanced healthcare directive available if possible. And if not, to indicate no advanced directive. It, it really highlights here the importance of asking for and reviewing the patient's advanced directive form. Now, what signatures are needed for this form to become a medical order? Well, the patient or the legally recognized decision maker and the physician, nurse practitioner, or physician's assistant. The first sentence in this is, I am aware that this form is voluntary. This is really important. We want to be sure nobody feels like they have been coerced or overly encouraged or required to complete a post form. So who speaks for the patient? Well, the legally recognized decision maker includes anyone recognized under California law, including the person named in an advanced healthcare directive, whether it's a verbal advanced directive, which is time limited, or a written advanced directive. The parent of a minor, a registered domestic partner, or a court-appointed conservator or guardian. And if none of these people exist, then health care providers may turn to the closest available relative to make decisions. This term was established in case law, but the court didn't define it very well. Health care providers should turn to the legally recognized health care decision maker, only if the patient lacks capacity, or if the patient has indicated that the decision maker's authority begins immediately. Now, what often happens in an emergency situation, the person who accompanies the patient to the emergency department, the person who's with the patient who makes the most noise, the person who seems to visit the most often, Oftentimes, that's the person that healthcare providers listen to, but it may or may not be the closest relative, and it may or may not be someone that the patient would have designated. And that's why it's important that all parties in this equation know whom the patient has chosen to be their spokesperson in the event they cannot speak for themselves. Let's start looking at the back side of your post form. The top of the back of the post form includes information for the patient, the nurse practitioner or physician's assistant supervising physician. So if a nurse practitioner or a PA sign the form, we still need to note whom their supervising physician, physician would be on the back of the post. The preparer's name. So let's say a social worker or a chaplain is assisting the patient. This is where that person would indicate their name and contact information. And an additional contact, if the decision maker is not the person signing the form or is not the healthcare agent on the advanced directive, include their information under additional contact. The patient can also list other contact persons here. If there is no additional contact person, then check the box none. 
It's purely informational to have this all completed. It's not required to be completed in order for the pulse to be valid. It does not appoint a healthcare decision maker. It just identifies contacts. And the healthcare provider listed on the form is not signing as a witness. It's simply a point of reference as the supervising physician over a physician's assistant or a nurse practitioner. So who can help complete the POLST? Well, POLST law stipulates that the POLST form shall be completed by a healthcare provider. The term healthcare provider is divine, defined by law as an individual licensed, certified, or otherwise permitted by the law of this state to provide health care in the ordinary course of business or practice of a profession. Best practice would include that those who are trained in the Pulse con conversation would be the ones completing the form, including the physician, a medical doctor, or a DO, a nurse, a nurse practitioner, or a physician assistant, a social worker, a chaplain, and it could be a social service designee if this person has received specific training in a pulsed conversation. There are many, many healthcare workers who can be excellently trained in having the pulsed conversation, but we would have to ensure for quality purposes that they understand the pulse really, really well, and they understand the interventions and the conditions that might require those interventions. So it's not a one and done kind of one hour class. To have the pulse conversation is a pretty extensive type of training. The key is to explore with patients and families their goals of care, and it requires a good understanding of the patient's entire medical condition and what to expect as this patient's disease progresses. So questions should be referred for discussion with the patient's physician, nurse practitioner, or physician's assistant. So let's look at directions for completing the POLST. Um, it's voluntary. It does not replace the advanced directive. It must be completed by a healthcare provider and understand patient preferences and medical indications. These directions here for the healthcare provider really are a recipe card to ensure that the provider who's helping to complete this form has done everything as, as indicated in the whole spirit of the POLST form. Um, it does say that use of the original form is strongly encouraged and recommended, although photocopies and faxes are legal and valid. But a copy should be retained in the patient's medical records on the ultra pink paper whenever possible. Any incomplete section of the POLST implies the default of full treatment for that section. That's important. So, especially if we're thinking about Section A with respect to um, CPR, if that's not checked, then we immediately go to default and we head for CPR. Um, when comfort in Section B, when comfort cannot be achieved in the current setting, the patient, including someone with comfort focused treatment, should be transferred to a setting able to provide comfort. An example would be treatment of a hip fracture. The POLST reads request transfer. A patient with capacity can still request their own transfer. So reviewing and modifying and voiding the POLST form. Again, the POLST should be reviewed periodically whenever there's a major change in condition, a transfer from one care setting to another, change in the patient's status, or any change, major change in the patient's family situation or care situation. A patient who has capacity can at any time request alternative treatment or revoke a POLST by any means that indicate, indicates their intention. It's recommended that revocation be documented by drawing a line through sections A through D and writing void right on that POLST in large letters and signing and dating the line. 
a legally recognized decision maker may request to modify the orders in collaboration with the healthcare provider based on known desires of the patient. So somebody who has, um, for example, uh, terminal cancer of the esophagus, who has said, I don't ever want artificial nutrition and hydration. Well, the cancer treatment of their esophagus might preclude them being able to eat. And maybe for a period of time until the patient heals from the treatment, if there's been surgery or if there's been extensive radiation, then maybe they do need to have uh, artificial nutrition for a set period of time. So the post can be modified, and that's important to know that it's, it's revocable, it can be voided, and it can be modified depending upon what's going on. Patty? Yes. This is Kim. I'm going to interrupt you just for a second and do a quick time check with everyone. We are at 1227, and for those of you getting CEs, if you logged on at 1130, uh, your required time frame will be met very soon. However, I just want to encourage everybody to stay on for the completion of this presentation and to make time for uh, some of the really fascinating questions that we're getting. And so before I turn it back over to you, Patty, I just also, in case people log off, want to take this time to thank our sponsors once again. Uh, we're so grateful for the support of O'Connor Mortuary, Care Choices, Hospice and Palliative Services, and Caring Companions at Home. And so back to you, Patty. Okay. And thank you. We are wrapping up. So the polls should be reviewed periodically, at least every five years. And whenever there is a transfer, a change in the patient's health status, the patient's treatment preferences might change. There's been a significant patient care conference. So the best practice would be to update the pulse forms to the most current version when reviewing other versions that predate 2017. The patient with capacity can request alternative treatment or revoke the post at any time, and the legally recognized decision maker may request a change based on new information regarding the patient's wishes or a change in condition. We should keep the post with the patient in the medical chart or um, transferred with the patient's paperwork, keep a copy if the patient is transferred, and review the post upon the patient's return to that care setting. At home, we say it should be magneted to the refrigerator or posted on the back of the patient's uh, door or above their bed. That way, if EMS is called, they can see it right away. This process really has some significant depth. It is more than just a form. It facilitates very deep and rich conversations about the patient's goals of care. It complements and goes beyond the advanced healthcare directive, and it incorporates the importance of patient comfort and choice. The POLST is orchestrated through the Coalition for Compassionate Care of California. In different states, different agencies monitor and make changes to the post. Here in California, it's the Coalition for Compassionate Care. And we rely on the conversation with patients, deep community collaboration, use of a consistent form, and comprehensive education to provide excellence in conversational skills with patients and families. So here's where you can get forms. They have to be purchased, um, but there are um, several ways to get them. Oftentimes when we give uh, a community education program, we provide forms for any of the community members that are attending. And we suggest that people then take the form and initiate a conversation with their doctor. Again, focus on the conversation. If you can, print it on the ultra pink 65 pounds cardstock, but it's not required. Copies and faxes are acceptable. And there's many kinds of post resources. We have them when we do in-person classes, difficult conversation brochures, or facing serious illness. Um, this is a consumer guide for use of the post. 
So here we are. We have con concluded the formal part of our presentation. And now I think I can take some questions if people have time. Yes, yes and I also, uh, before we go there, Patty, I just want to mention to everyone uh, that <clears throat> Alzheimer's Orange County uh, offers classes on an ongoing basis through Patty's department on advanced care planning. Um, we also offer uh, a course called Care, Prepare, and Connect, uh, and many other things to do with end-of-life planning. So make sure you check that out on our website. Um, Patty, we have a couple of questions that I believe were answered already. Okay. Uh, one was about the Pulse being recognized nationwide, and we did learn that uh, even though it's not in every state, that adherence to Pulse wishes is mandated. Is that correct? Adherence to Pulse is mandated state by state. So oh. if you have a Pulse in California and you travel to a state that has not implemented a Pulse or similar document, the healthcare providers are likely to honor it, but they are not required to do so. Okay. So it's important to know if you're going to another state for an extended trip, whether or not the post would be honored. And it might even be appropriate to fill out that state's form in the event you're going to be there for an extended period of time. Thank you, Patty. Uh, this question, I think, was just answered as well. Does it always have to be an original, or can you make copies? And I believe you said that copies are fine, but you suggest that they be made in ultra pink, correct? If at all possible, make those copies <laughs> on pink paper. <laughs> Great. Um, one of our uh, viewers is asking about current life expectancy. What is the current life expectancy? Um, I don't... I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and interpret that question. Generally speaking, a post form is appropriate for someone for whom no one would be surprised if they died within one year. So a barometer would be an approximate expectancy of a year. But sometimes people have a post and they live much longer than that but no one would be surprised given their clinical presentation if they died within one year. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> this question refers to the map that was shown. Yes. Uh, what is meant by no program contacts for Oregon since Pulse was developed in that state? Um, I think it means we just don't have a person to contact in Oregon right now. Um, but I can, if somebody needs to contact someone in Oregon, I can find that information for you. Okay, thank you. Um, what else? That question was addressed. Uh, what happens if there is conflicting wishes in the POST versus the Advanced Healthcare Directive? If that's the case, then the POLST would take precedence because the POLST is a legal medical order. Everyone would also look at the date of execution because if the advanced healthcare directive came after the POLST and was markedly different, then there would be some conversation about how best to proceed. Okay, thank you. Um, one person, Patty, was asking if there would be a transcription uh, provided because I know there was just a lot of information that you shared. And in case anyone else is wondering about that, that is not possible. However, as a reminder, all of our webinars, uh, with rare exceptions, are, uh, are taped and available uh, online on our website. So uh, this, this recording will be available uh, pretty, I think it takes a little while before we get it up there, but um, it's also a great opportunity for me to remind people to visit that library to uh, catch webinars that you may have missed or share them with staff. Uh, so let's see, someone is just saying, thank you, thank you, so much to absorb. Yeah, well, you're welcome. You're welcome. It's my pleasure. And what else? 
What should be done if a patient wants CPR but does not want ventilation once hospitalized? Well, then uh, they should certainly make those wishes known, but if you have CPR, you have to be willing to go with advanced cardiac life support, and that includes intubation if necessary. So it's kind of a catch-22. If you don't ever want to be intubated, then you probably should have a conversation in context to help people understand that perhaps they shouldn't ask for CPR. Thank you, Patty. How or where is trial period of full treatment quantified? That well, is, how does, how does one indicate the length of the trial period? Sure. It can be noted on the pulse form. It can be noted in the patient's chart. Um, typically, um, if you're going to be intubated, then the trial period is uh, usually less than two weeks um, because after that, then um, people often have to have a tracheostomy if they're going to be intubated for longer than that period of time. So it's conversational and it could be noted on the form with the doctor and the patient. And trial period also might be a little bit fluid because if you're starting to improve and you're getting to the end of the trial period that you've noted, you wouldn't want that to be a hard and fast rule. You would want to have medical judgment come into play. Okay, great. Patty, um, as some of you are getting ready to leave, I want to mention uh, that our next webinar is Tuesday, May 14th, and we have a fascinating topic. It's understanding hoarding behaviors. So we'll learn some insights and innovations around the issue of hoarding, and we'll have Krista uh, Tipton from APS. She's a senior social worker there. So that should be another fascinating topic, uh, and I wanted to let everyone know about that before you uh, take off and get back to your work day. We have just a couple more questions for those that wish to remain. And Patty, the next question is, could you repeat what was said regarding antibiotics not necessarily being used to treat an illness? So um, when is it appropriate and when is it not regarding comfort-focused treatment? Okay, that would be a decision made with the patient's doctor and other clinical staff and if the patient has capacity with the patient or with the patient's family or um, legally recognized decision makers. In some cases, antibiotics are always used if there's a urinary tract infection or some kind of an infection that causes discomfort or even pain. Um, as with the urinary tract infection, you sometimes have urgency and burning upon urination. So an antibiotic is really the best way to treat that. In many cases, if there's a pneumonia or some other kind of uh, infection and the patient is truly at end stage and comfort care is what the focus is, it may not be necessary to introduce an antibiotic. It might, the antibiotic actually might cause more discomfort than it's seeking to, um, to solve. So that becomes a medical decision that um, people would make with the patient's doctor and the entire uh, holistic look at the patient's condition would be extremely important in that. Sometimes a pneumonia is not treated if the patient is, um, say, quite at end-stage um, dementia or end-stage cancer. Sometimes that antibiotic causes more gastroenteritis than it really helps in treating that infection. So. Again, it's a medical decision. Thank you, Patty. We have one final question, and it is on the issue of food and feeding. Um, I believe it's referring to a quote that you made, food should always be offered by the mouth, and the uh, attendee is saying no, C-V-S-E-D. Because oh, that's I, I guess that's that's voluntary stopping eating and drinking. Well, that's oh, okay. for, that's for another class. That would be yeah. um, value judgment on whether or not um, that form of um, uh, voluntary stopping eating and drinking would be appropriate. Um, again, that's a value judgment because some people 
view that as part of the um, concert of assisted suicide. So um, if somebody is able to safely take food and fluid by mouth, then comfort feeding is generally established as best practice. Even if people can't take enough food and fluid to sustain life, um, this notion of comfort feeding is generally considered to be the most humane. Okay, so um, that, you know, this is kind of a good note to end on because it's making me think that maybe we should have a workshop in the future about value-laden decisions, et cetera. That might be really interesting, but uh, we will save that for another time. And I want to thank our wonderful speaker, Patty Mutan, and uh, she certainly shared a lot of valuable information with us. Uh, as we end the webinar today, uh, again, your evaluation will pop up on the screen. We thank our speakers. We thank uh, everyone involved in the efforts of this monthly education series. And we look forward to seeing you back here next month for Understanding Hoarding Behaviors. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day.